So let's try that again. Um, seems like YouTube is trying to shut me down because I don't own the rights to Legend. So hopefully they won't catch me if I don't talk about the book title too much. I don't really know. So for any of you who are just kicked off, I'm very sorry. I was also kicked off. Um, I'm hoping to disguise these readings a little better then, I guess, because since I can't read to you in person, they're assuming I'm trying to like sell the book or something. So I'll have to just like hide the cover of the book so they don't know like who wrote this or something. I don't, I don't really know what's going on. So uh, yeah, so hopefully they won't catch me. If they do, I'll just have to record a video and not do it live, unfortunately, which I hate because I would much rather do this live. So uh, we're going to get started just because it's 1030. And uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time to really read a good chunk of the book. <clears throat> hey, baby. Okay. So back to what I was saying before they shut me down. Um, they Yesterday we read three chapters of the book. We read through the first three um chapters where we got to know our main characters um, in Legend. We got to know Day and June. And Day, it seems like, is some sort of vigilante kind of character. Um, we saw him looking at a house, which apparently contains his family. And as the first line of the book says, his family thinks that he is dead. They do not know that he's alive. So he was looking at their house and he saw that they were marked with the plague symbol. Um, but it's a weird one. It's not the normal X they put on the door. I put an X with a line through it. So it's a weird little symbol. Um, then we see June who apparently just got in trouble, um, for climbing some buildings. Seems a little bit like peak now, doesn't it? Um, but she was in trouble because, uh, she keeps doing this. Apparently, apparently she's a prodigy. She's the, the person that Day was talking about who got a perfect score on her trials. And the trials are the way that they um, test you to see like what career you're good for and stuff like that in this world. So we're going to get started. So last thing we know is that um, Day broke into a hospital. Seems like he's been trying to steal um, cures for the plague to try to get them to his family and to other people who can't afford it. Um, and that's where he encountered Matthias, who is June's brother. All right, June. I still remember the day that my brother missed his induction ceremony into the military, into the public military, a Sunday afternoon, hot and mucky, brown clouds covered the sky. I was seven years old and Matthias was 19. My white shepherd puppy, Ollie, was asleep in our apartment's cool marble floor. I lay feverishly in bed while Matthias sat by my side his brow furrowed with worry. We could hear the loudspeakers outside playing the Republic's national pledge. When they got to the part mentioning our president, Matias stood and saluted in the direction of the Capitol. Our illustrious Elector Primo had just accepted another four-year presidential term. That would make his, this his 11th term. You don't have to sit here with me, you know, I said to him after the pledge finished. Go to your induction. I'll be sick either way. Matias ignored me and placed another cool towel on my head. I'll be inducted either way, he said. He fed, a purple, he fed me a purple slice of orange. I remember watching him peel the fruit, the orange for me. He cut one long, efficient line in the fruit's peel, then removed it all in one piece. But it's Commander Jameson. I blinked through swollen eyes. She did you a favor by not assigning you to the war front. She'll be upset you're skipping. Won't she mark it on your record? You don't want to be kicked out like some street con. Matias tapped his nose, my nose disapprovingly. Don't call people that, Junebug. It's rude. And she can't kick me off her patrol for missing the ceremony. Besides, he added with a wink, I can always hack into their database and wipe my record clean. I grinned. Someday, I wanted to be inducted into the military, too, draped in the Republic's dark robes. Maybe I'd even be lucky enough to get assigned to the renowned commander like Matias did. I opened my mouth so that he could feed me another piece of orange. You should skip going to Batala more often. Maybe you'd get have time to get a girlfriend. Matias laughed. I don't need girlfriends. I've got a baby sister to take care of. Come on, you're going to get a girlfriend someday. We'll see. Guess I'm picky like that. I stopped to look my brother directly in the eyes. Matias, did her mother take care of me when I was sick? Did she do things like this? Matias reached over to push sweaty strands of my hair away from my face. Don't be stupid, Junebug. Of course mom took care of you. 
and she was much better at it than I am. No, you take care of me the best, I murmured. My eyelids were growing heavy. My brother smiled. Nice of you to say so. You're not going to leave me too, are you? You'll stay with me longer than mom and dad did? Matias kissed me on the forehead. Forever and ever, kid, until you're sick and tired of seeing me. Zero and one hour. Ruby Sector. 72 degrees Fahrenheit indoors. I know something has gone wrong the instant Thomas shows up at our door. The lights in all residential buildings have gone off, just as Matias had said they would. And nothing but oil lamps light the apartment. Ollie is barking up a storm. I'm dressed in my training uniform and a black and red vest with my boots laced up and my hair tied back in a tight ponytail. For a brief moment, I'm actually glad that Matias isn't the one waiting at the door. He'd see my getup and know that I'm headed out to the track, defying him again. When I open the door, Thomas coughs nervously at the surprised look on my face and pretends to smile. There's a streak of black grease on his forehead, probably from his own index finger, which means he just finished polishing his rifle earlier in the evening and his patrol inspection is tomorrow. I cross my arms. He touches the ed edge of my cap light of his cap politely. Hello, Miss Paris, he says. I take a deep breath. I'm heading out to the track. Where's Matias? Commander Jameson has requested that you come with me to the hospital as soon as possible. Thomas hesitates for a second. It's more of an order than a request. There's a hollow feeling in the pit of my stomach. Why didn't she just call me? I ask. She prefers for me to escort you. Why? My voice starts to rise. Where's my brother? Now Thomas takes a deep breath. I already know what he's going to say. I'm sorry. Matias has been killed. That's when the world around me goes silent. As if from a great distance, I can see that Thomas is spe still speaking, gesturing with his hands, pulling me to him for a hug. I hug him back without realizing what I'm doing. I feel nothing. I nod when he steadies me and asks, and asks me to do something, to follow him. He keeps an arm around my shoulders. A dog's wet nose nudges my hand. Ollie follows me out of the apartment. I tell him to stay close. I lock the door and stuff the key into my pocket and let Thomas guide us through the darkness and to the stairs. He's talking the whole time, but I can't hear him. I stare straight ahead at the reflective metal decorations lining the stairwell, at the distorted reflections of Ollie and me. I can't make out my expression. I'm not sure I even have one. Matthias should have taken me with him. This is my first coherent thought as we reach the bottom floor of our high rise and climb into a waiting Jeep. Ollie jumps into the back seat and sticks his head out the window. The car smells damp, like rubber and metal and fresh sweat. A group of people must have ridden in here recently. Thomas sits in the driver's seat and makes sure my seatbelt is buckled. Such a small, stupid thing. Matthias should have taken me with him. I run this thought over and over in my head. Thomas doesn't say anything else. He lets me stare out at the darkened city as we go, occasionally shooting me a hesitant glance. Some small part of me makes a mental note to apologize to him later. My eyes glaze over at the familiar buildings we pass. People, mostly workers hired from the slums, pack the first floor stands even with the lights out, hunched over bowls of cheap food in the ground level cafes. Clouds of steam float high in the distance. Jumbotrons, always on, regardless of power shortages, display the latest warnings about floods and quarantines. A few are about the Patriots, this time for another bombing up in, the, up in Sacramento that killed half a dozen soldiers. A few cadets, 11-year-olds with yellow stripes on their sleeves, linger at the steps outside the academy, the old and worn Walt Disney Concert Hall, letters almost completely faded. Several other military jeeps cross our intersection, and I see the blank faces of their soldiers. Some of them have black goggles on, so I can't see their eyes at all. The sky looks more overcast than usual. Signs of a rainstorm. I pull my hood over my head in case I forget where we finally, when we finally get out of the car. When I turn my attention back to the window, I see the part of downtown that sits inside Batala. All the lights in this military sector are on. The hospital's tower looms just a few blocks away. Thomas notices me craning my neck for a better view. Almost there, he says. As we draw near, I can see the crisscross lines of yellow tape surrounding the bottom of the tower, the clusters of city patrol soldiers, red stripes on their sleeves like Matias, as well as some photo photographers and street police, the black vans and medic trucks. Ollie lets out a whine. I'm guessing they didn't catch the person, I say to Thomas. How do you know? I nod toward the building. 
That's really something, I continue. Whoever it was survived a two and a half story jump and still had enough strength to escape. Thomas looked toward the tower and tries to see what I see. The broken third story stairwell window, the taped off section right below it, the soldiers searching alleyways, the lack of ambulances. We haven't caught the guy, he admits after a moment. The rifle grease on his forehead gives him a bewildered look, but that doesn't mean we won't find his body later. You won't find it if you haven't found it yet. Thomas opens his mouth to say something, then decides against it and goes back to concentrating on the road. When the Jeep finally rolls to a stop, Commander Jameson breaks away from the group of guards she's standing with and marches over to my car door. I'm sorry, Thomas says abruptly to me. I feel a brief pang of guilt for my coldness and decide to nod back at him. His father had been a janitor for our apartment high-rise before he died. His late mother, a cook at my grade school. Matias had been one, the one to recommend Thomas, who had a high trial score, to be assigned to the prestigious city patrols, despite his humble background. So he must feel just as numb as I do. Commander Jameson walks up to my car door and raps twice on the window to get my attention. Her thin lips are painted an angry stroke of red. And in the night, her auburn hair looks almost... Her auburn hair looks dark brown, almost black. Move it to Paris. Time is of the essence. Her eyes flicker to Ollie in the back seat. That's not a police dog, kid. Even now, her demeanor is unflinching. I step out of the Jeep and give her a quick salute. Ollie jumps down next to me. You called for me, Commander, I say. Commander Jameson doesn't bother to return my gesture. She starts walking away, and I'm forced to hurry, alongside, hurry along beside her, struggling to fall into step. Your brother Matthias is dead, she says. Her tone doesn't change. I'm of the understanding that you are almost done with your training as an agent, correct? And that you've finished your courses on tracking? I find hard to breathe. A second confirmation of Matthias' death. Yes, Commander, I managed to say. We head into the hospital. Waiting room is empty. They've cleared out all patients. Guards are clustered near the stairwell entrance. That's probably where the crime scene starts. Commander Jameson keeps her eyes forward and her hands behind her back. What's your trial score? 1,500, Commander. Everyone in the military knows my score, but Commander Jameson likes to pretend not to know or care. She doesn't stop walking. Oh, that's right, she says, as if it's the first time she heard it. Maybe you'll be of use after all. I've called ahead to Drake and told him that you are dismissed from further training. You were almost done with your coursework anyway. I frown. Commander? I received a full history of your grades there. Perfect scores. You've already finished most of your courses in half the number of years, yes? They also say you're quite a troublemaker. Is this true? I can't understand what she wants from me. Sometimes, Commander. Am I in trouble? Did they expel me? Commander Jameson smiles. Hardly. They've graduated you early. Follow me. There's something I want you to see. I want to ask about Matthias, about what happened here, but her icy demeanor stops me. We walk down a first floor hall until we reach an emergency exit door at the very end of it. There, Commander Jameson waves away the soldiers guarding it and ushers me through. A low growl rumbles in Ollie's throat. We step out into open air, this time at the back of the building. I realize that we are now inside the yellow tape. Dozens of soldiers stand in clusters around us. Hurry up, Commander Jameson snaps at me. I quicken my pace. A moment later, I realize that what she wants to show me and where we are walking. Not far ahead is an object covered in a white sheet. Six feet long, human. Feet and limbs look intact under the clothing. Definitely didn't fall naturally like that, so someone had to lay him out. I start to tremble. When I look down at Ollie, I see that the fur on his back is standing up. I call to him several times, but he refuses to walk any closer. So I'm forced to follow Cap Commander Jameson and leave him behind. Matias kissed me on my forehead. Forever and ever, kid, until you're sick and tired of seeing me. Commander Jameson halts in front of the white sheet and bends down and throws it aside. I stare down at the dead body of a soldier, clad in military black, a knife still protruding from his chest. Dark blood stains his shirt, his shoulder, his hands, the grooves of his knife hilt. His eyes are closed now. I kneel before him and the smooth and smooth strands of his dark hair away from his face. It's odd. I don't take in any details of the scene. I still feel nothing but that deep numbness. Tell me about what might have happened to your cadet, Commander Jameson demands. Consider this a pop quiz. This soldier's identity should, not, should motivate you to get it right. I don't even flinch from the sting of her words. The details rush in and I start talking. 
Whoever hit him with his knife either stabbed him from close range or has an incredibly strong throwing arm. Right-handed, I run my fingers along the blood-caked handle. Impressive aim. The knife is one of a pair, correct? See this pattern painted at the bottom of the blade? It cuts off abruptly. Commander Jameson nods. The second knife is stuck in the wall of the stairwell. I look toward the dark alley that my brother's feet point to and notice the sewer cover several yards away. That's where he made his getaway, I say. I estimate the direction the sewer cap is turned in. He's also left-handed. Interesting. He's ambidextrous. Please continue. From here, the sewers will take him deeper into the city or west of the ocean. He'll choose the city. He's probably too wounded to do otherwise. But it's impossible to track him accurately now. If he has any sense, he'll have, to have taken half a dozen turns down there and done it in the sewer water, too. He wouldn't have touched the walls. He'll give us nothing to track. I'm going to leave you here for a bit so you can collect your thoughts. Meet me in two minutes in the third floor stairwell so I can give the photographer some room. She glances once at Matias's body before she turns away. For a brief second, her face softens. What a waste of a good soldier. Then she shakes her head and leaves. I watch her go. The others around me stay a good distance away, apparently eager to avoid an awkward conversation. I look down at my brother's face again. To my surprise, he appears peaceful. His skin looks tan, not pale like I'd assumed it would. I half expect his eyes to flutter, his mouth to smile. Bits of dried blood flake off onto my hands. When I try to brush them off, they stick to my skin. I don't know if this is what sets off my anger. My hands start shaking so hard that I press them against Matias's clothes in an attempt to steady them. I'm supposed to be analyzing the crime scene, but I can't concentrate. You should have taken me with you, I whisper to him. Then I lean my head against his and begin to cry. In my mind, I make a silent promise to my brother's killer. I will hunt you down. I will scour the streets of Los Angeles for you. Search every street in the Republic if I have to. I will trick you and deceive you. Lie, cheat, and steal to find you. Tempt you out of your hiding place and chase you until you have nowhere else to run. I make you this promise. Your life is mine. Too soon, soldiers come to take Matias to the morgue. 0317 hours. My apartment. Same night. The rain has started. I lie on the couch with my arm draped over Ollie. The spot where Matias usually sits is empty. Stacks of old photo albums and Matias's journals clutter up the coffee table. He'd always loved our parents' old-fashioned ways and kept handwritten journals just like how they'd kept all those paper photos. You can't trace or tag them online, he always said. Ironic, coming from an expert hacker. Was it just this afternoon that he'd picked me up from, Dur from Drake? He wanted to talk to me about something important right before he left. But now I'll never know what he had to say. Papers and reports cover my stomach. One of my hands clutches a pendant necklace, a piece of evidence I'd been studying for a while now. I squint at its smooth surface, its lack of patterns. Then I drop my hand with a sigh. My head hurts. I learned earlier why Cap Commander Jameson pulled me out of Drake. She'd had her eye on me for a long time. Now she suddenly has one less on Matias' patrol, and she's looking to add an agent. A perfect time to nab me before other recruiters do. Starting tomorrow, Thomas is taking over Matias' position for the time being, and I'm entering the patrol as a detective agent in training. My first mission? Day. We've tried a variety of tactics to catch Day in the past, but none of them have worked, Jameson told me just before she sent me home. So, here's what we'll do. I'll continue with my patrol's projects. For you, let's test out your skills with a practice run. Show me how you track Day. Maybe you'll get somewhere. Maybe not. But you're a set of fresh young eyes, and if you impress me, I'll promote you to be a full agent on this patrol. I'll make you famous. The youngest agent out there. I close my eyes and try to think. Day killed my brother. I know this because we found a stolen ID tag lying halfway up the third floor stairwell, which led us to the soldier pictured on the tag, who stammered out a description of what the boy looked like. His description didn't match anything we had on file for Day, but the truth is we know little about what he looks like except that he's young, like the kid in the hospital tonight. The fingerprints on the ID tag are the same prints found just last month at a crime scene linked to Day prints that don't match any civilian the Republic has on record. Day was there in the hospital. He was also careless enough to leave the ID tag behind. Which makes me wonder. Day broke into the laboratory for medicine as part of a desperate, last-minute, poorly thought-out plan. He must have stolen plague suppressants and painkillers because he couldn't find anything stronger. 
He himself certainly doesn't have the plague, not with the way he was able to escape. But someone else he knows must. Someone he cares about enough to risk his life for. Someone living in Blue Ridge or Lake or Winter or Alta. Sectors all recently affected by the plague. If this is true, Day won't be leaving the city anytime soon. He's bound here by this connection, motivated by emotions. Day could also have a sponsor who hired him to pull the stunt. But the hospital is a dangerous place, and a sponsor would have had to pay Day a great deal of money. And if that much money was involved, he certainly would have planned more thoroughly and known when the laboratory's next shipment of plague medicine would arrive. Besides, Day wasn't a mercenary in any of his past crimes. He's attacked the Republic's military assets on his own, slowed down shipments to the warfront, and destroyed our warfront-bound airships and fighter jets. He has some sort of agenda to stop us from winning against the colonies. For a while, we thought he might work for the colonies, but his jobs are crude, without high-tech equipment or noticeable funding behind them. Not really what you'd expect from our enemy. He's never taken jobs for hire as far as I know, and it's unlikely he'd start now. Who would hire an untested mercenary? Another possible sponsor is the Patriots, but if Day had been working for them on this job, one of the Patriots would have drawn their signature flag. 13 red and white stripes with 50 white dots on a blue rectangle. On a wall somewhere near the crime scene by now. They'd never miss a chance to claim victory. But the biggest thing that doesn't compute for me is this. Day has never killed anyone before. That's another reason why I don't think he's connected with the Patriots. In one of his past crimes, he crept on into a quarantine zone by tying quarantine zone by tying up a street policeman. The policeman didn't have a scratch on him except a black eye. Another time, he broke into a bank vault but left the four security guards at its back entrance untouched, although a bit stupefied. He once torched a whole squadron of fighter jets on an empty airfield in the middle of the night, and has on two occasions grounded airships by crippling their engines. He once vandalized the side of a military building. He's stolen food, money, and goods. But he doesn't set roadside bombs. He doesn't shoot so soldiers. He doesn't attempt assassinations. He doesn't kill. So why Matthias? Day could have made his escape without killing him. Did Day hold some sort of grudge? Had my brother done something to him in the past? It couldn't have been accidental. That knife went straight through Matthias' heart. Straight through his intelligent, stupid, stubborn, overprotective heart. I open my eyes, then lift my hand and study the pendant necklace again. It belongs to Day. Fingerprints told us that much. It's a circular disc with nothing engraved on it, something we found lying on the floor of the hospital stairwell along the stolen ID. It's not from any religion I know of. It's worth nothing in terms of money. Cheap nickel and copper, necklace part made of plastic. Which means he probably didn't steal it, and it has a different meaning for him and is worth carrying around with the, with the risk of losing or dropping it. Maybe it's a good luck charm. Maybe it was given to him by someone he has emotional ties with. Maybe this is the same person he tried to steal plague medicine for. It has a secret. I just don't know what. Day's exploits used to fascinate me. But now he is my matched enemy, my target, my first mission. I gather my thoughts for two days. On the third day, I call Commander Jameson. I have a plan. Day. I'm dreaming that I'm home again. Eden sits on the floor, drawing some sort of loopy shape on the floorboards. He's about four or five years old, with cheeks still round with baby fat. Every few minutes, he gets up and asks me to critique his art. John and I are crouched together on the sofa, trying in vain to fix the radio that we've had in our family for years. I can still remember when Dad brought it home. It'll tell us which quarters have the plague, he said. But now it screws and dials sit worn and lifeless in our laps. I ask Eden for help, but he just giggles and tells us to do it ourselves. Mom stands alone in our tiny kitchen, trying to cook dinner. This is a scene I know well. Both her hands are wrapped in thick bandages. She must have cut herself on broken bottles or empty tins while cleaning out the trash cans around Union Station today. She winces as she breaks up some frozen corn kernels with the flat edge of a knife. Her injured hands tremble. Stop, Mom. I'll help you. I try to get up, but my feet feel glued to the floor. <laughs> Tyler, if you have a question, just ask it. That's fine. And we'll get to it. After a while, I lift my, my head to see what Eden's drawing now. At first, I can't make out what the shapes are. They seem jumbled littered in random patterns under his busy hand. When I look closer, I realize that he's drawing soldiers breaking into our home. He's drawing them with a blood red crayon. I wake with a start. Dim streaks of light gray and waning 
or of light, gray and waning, are filtering in through the nearby window. I hear the faint sound of rain. I'm in what looks like a child's abandoned bedroom. The wallpaper is blue and yellow and peeling at the corners. Two candles light the room. I can feel my feet hanging off the end of the bed. There's a pillow under my head. When I shift, I let out a moan and close my eyes. Tessa's voice drifts over to me. Can you hear me? She says. Not so loud, cousin. My voice comes out in a whisper through dry lips. My head throbs with a blinding, stabbing headache. Tess recognizes the pain on my face and stays quiet while I keep my eyes closed and wait it out. The pain goes on, like a pick slamming repeatedly into the back of my head. After an eternity, the headache finally starts to fade. I open my eyes. Where am I? Are you all right? Tess's face comes into focus. She has her hair pulled back in a short braid, and her lips are pink and smiling. Am I all right? She says. You've been knocked out for over two days. How are you feeling? Pain hits me in waves, this time from the wounds that must cover me. Fantastic. Tessa's smile fades. You pulled a close one there. Closest one yet. If I hadn't found someone to take us in, I don't think you would have made it. I don't know if it tells us what year this is. I think all we can tell is that it happens after there's a split in America, I guess. Um, because we're in the Republic of America. So I'll continue. Suddenly everything comes rushing back to me. I remember the hospital entrance, the stolen ID tag and the stairwell in the laboratory, the long fall, my knife thrown at the captain, the sewers, the medicine, the medicine. I try to sit up, but I move too fast and have to bite my lip from the pain. My hand flies to my neck. There's no pendant to grab. Something aches in my chest. I lost it. My father had given me that pendant, and now I'd been careless enough to lose it. Tess tries to calm me. Easy there. Is my family okay? Did some of the medicine survive the fall? Some of it. Tess helps me back down before leaning her elbows on my bed. I guess suppressants are better than nothing. I dropped it off at your mother's home already, along with your gift bundle. I went through the back and handed them all off to John. He says to tell you thanks. You didn't tell John what happened, did you? Tess rolls her eyes. You think I can keep that from him? Everyone's heard about the break-in at the hospital by now. And John knows you're hurt. He's pretty angry about it. Do you say who's sick? Is it Eden? Mom? Tess bites her lip. It's Eden. John says everyone else is fine for now. But Eden can talk and seems alert enough. He tried to get out of bed and help your mother fix the leak under your sink to prove he felt strong. But of course, he, she sent him back to bed. She ripped up two of her shirts to use as cool cloths for Eden's fever. So John said if you find any more clothes that fit mom, he'd be happy to take them. I let out a deep breath. Eden. Of course it's Eden. Still acting like a little engineer, even with the plague. At least I managed to get some medicine. Everything's going to work out. Eden will be okay for a while, and I don't mind dealing with John's lectures. As for my lost pendant, well, for an instant, I'm glad that my mother can't find out about this because it would break her heart. I couldn't find any cures, and I didn't have time to do a search. It's okay, Tess replies. She prepares a fresh bandage for my arm. I see my worn old cap hanging in the back of her chair. Your family has some time. We'll get another chance. Whose house are we in? As soon as I ask this question, I hear a door close then footsteps in the room next to ours. I look at Tess in alarm. She just nods quietly at me and tells me to relax. A man walks in, shaking dirty drops of rain from an umbrella. He carries a brown paper bag in his hands. You're awake, he says to me. That's good. I study his face. He's very pale and a little chubby, with bushy eyebrows and kindly eyes. Girl, he says, looking at Tess. Do you think you can leave by tomorrow night? We'll be on our way by then. Tess picks up a bottle of something clear. Alcohol, I guess and wets the edge of the bandage with it. I flinch when she touches it to where a bullet had grazed, his, my, grazed my arm. It feels like a match lit against my skin. Thank you again, sir, for letting us stay here. The man grunts, his expression uncertain, and awkwardly nods his head. He looks around the room as if searching for something he's lost. I'm afraid that's as long as I can keep you. The plague patrol is going to do another sweep soon. He hesitates. Then he pulls two cans from the paper bag and sets them down on the drawer. Some chili for you. It's not the best, but it'll fill you up. I'll bring you some bread, too. 
Before either of us can say anything, he hurries out of the room with the rest of his groceries. For the first time, I look down at my body. I'm clothed in a brown pair of army trousers, and my bare chest and arm are bandaged. So is one of my legs. Why is he helping us? I ask Tess in a low voice. She looks up from wrapping the fresh bandage around my arm. Don't be so suspicious. He had a son who worked at the war front. He died of the plague a few years ago. I yelp when Tess ties a finishing knot on the bandage. Breathe in for me. I do as she says. Several sharp pains stab me as she presses her fingers delicately against different parts of my chest. Her cheeks turn pink as she works. You might have a crack in one of your ribs, but definitely no breaks. You should heal quickly enough. Anyway, the man didn't ask our names, and so I didn't ask his. his. Best not to know. I told him why you got yourself injured like this. I think it reminded him of his son. I lay my head back on the on the back down on my the pillow. My body hurts all over. I lost both my knives, I mutter, so the man doesn't hear me. They were good knives. Sorry to hear, Day, Tess says. She brushes a stray hair from her face and leans over me. She holds a clear plastic bag with three silver bullets inside. I found these caught in the folds of your clothes and figured you might want them for your slingshot or something. She stuffs the bag into one of my pockets. I smile. When I first met Tess three years ago, she was a skinny 10-year-old orphan rummaging through trash bins in the NEMA section, sector. She needed my help so much in those early years that I sometimes forget how much I rely on her now. Thanks, cousin, I say. She murmurs something I can't understand and looks away. After a while, I fall back into a deep sleep. When I wake up again, I don't know how much time has passed. The headache is gone and it's dark outside. It might be the same day, although I feel like I've slept far too long for that. No soldiers, no police. We're still alive. I lie unmoving for a moment, wide awake in the darkness. Looks like our caretaker hasn't reported us, yet. Tess is dozing on the edge of the bed with her head tucked into her arms. Sometimes I wish I could find her a good home, some kind of family willing to take her in. But every time I have this thought, I push it away, because Tess would be back on the Republic's grid if she ever joined a real family. And she'd be forced to take the trial, because she never took it before. Or worse, they'd learned about her aff affiliation with me and interrogate her. Too na naive, too easily manipulated. I wouldn't trust her with anyone else. Besides, I'd miss her. The first two years I'd spent wandering the streets by myself were lonely ones. I gingerly move my ankle in a circle. It's a little stiff, but otherwise pretty painless. No torn muscles, no serious swelling. My bullet wound still burns, and my ribs ache something fierce. But this time I'm strong enough to sit up without too much trouble. My hands go automatically up to my hair, which is loose and hanging past my, my shoulders. With one hand, I pull it into a messy tail and twist it into a tight knot. Then I lean over Tess, grab my beaten newsboy cap from the chair and put it on. My arms burn from the effort. I smell chili and bread. There's a bowl with some steam rising from it on the dresser next to the bed, and a small loaf of bread balanced on the bowl's edge. I think back to the two cans our caretaker had placed on the dresser. My stomach growls. I devour it all. As I'm licking the last of the chili off my fingers, I hear a door close somewhere in the house, and moments later, footsteps rushing toward our room. I tense up. Next to me, Tess jerks awake and grabs my arm. What was that? She bursts out. I hold a finger to my lips. Our caretaker hurries into the room, a tattered robe draped over his pajamas. You should leave now, he whispers. Sweat beads on his forehead. I just heard about a man who's been looking for you. I stare, levelly at him. Tess gives me a panicked look. How do you know? I ask. A man starts cleaning up the room. The man starts cleaning up the room, grabbing my empty bowl and wiping down the dresser. He's telling people that he has plague cures for someone who needs it. He says he knows that you're injured. He never gave a name, but he must be talking about you. I sit up straight and swing my legs over the side of the bed. There's no choice now. He's talking about me. I agree. Tess snatches up a few clean bandages and stuffs them under her shirt. It's a trap. We'll leave immediately. The ma man nods once. You can get out through the back door, straight into the hall on your left. I take a moment to meet his eyes. In that instant, I realize that he knows exactly who I am. He won't say it out loud, though. Like other people in our sector who have realized who I am and helped, in helped me in the past, he doesn't exactly disapprove of the trouble I caused for the Republic. We're very grateful, I say. He says nothing in return. I grab Tess's hand, and we make our way out of the bedroom, down the hall, and through the back door. The night's humidity is thick. My eyes water from the pain of my wounds. We make our way through the silent back alleys for six blocks, until we finally slow down. 
My injuries are screaming now. I reach up to touch my pendant necklace for comfort, but then I remember that it's no longer around my neck. A sick feeling rises in my stomach. What if the Republic figures out what it is? Will they destroy it? What if they trace it back to my family? Tess slumps to the ground and rests her head against the alley wall. We need to leave the city, she says. It's too dangerous here, Day. You know it is. Arizona or Colorado would be safer. Or come on, even Barstow. I don't mind the outskirts. Yeah, yeah, I know. I look down. I want to leave too. But you won't. I can see it on your face. We're silent for a while. If it were up to me, I'd cross the whole country alone and escape into the colony's first chance I got. I don't mind mis risking my own life, but there are a dozen reasons I can't go, and Tess knows it. It's not like John and Mom can just pick up and leave their assigned jobs to flee with me, not without raising an alert. It's not like Eden can just withdraw from his assigned school, not unless they want to become fugitives like me. We'll see, I finally say. Tess, give Tess gives me a tragic smile. Who do you think is looking for you? She asks that for a while. How do they know we're in the lake sector? I don't know. Could be a dealer who heard about the hospital break-in. Maybe they think we have a lot of money or something. Could be a soldier, even a spy. I lost my pendant at the hospital. I don't know how they would use it to learn anything about me, but there's always a chance. What are you going to do about it? I shrug. My bullet wound had begun to throb, and I leaned against the wall for support. I'm sure as hell not meeting him, whoever he is. But I got to admit, I'm sure curious to see what he has to say. What if he does have the plague cures? Tess stares at me. It's the same expression she wore the very first night I met her. Hopeful, curious, and fearful all at once. Well, can't be any more dangerous than your crazy hospital break-in, yeah? We'll read one more. Um, to answer your question, Tyler, I think that she just, like, he came up to the surface and she dragged him up. Maybe that guy helped him? Helped her, I would assume. All right, June. I don't know if it's because Commander Jameson has taken pity on me or if she really does feel the loss of Matthias, one of her most valued soldiers, but she helps me arrange his funeral, even though she's never done that for one of her soldiers before. She refuses to say anything about why she chose to do it. Wealthy families like ours always have elaborate funerals. Matthias's take place inside a building with soaring Baroque archways and stained glass windows. They've covered the bare floors with white carpets, round white banquet, banquet tables overflowing with white lilacs fill the room. The only colors come from the Republic flags and circular gold Republic seal hanging behind the room's front altar, the portrait of our glorious elector looming above them all. All the mourners wear their best whites. I have on an elaborate white gown, laced and corseted, with a silk overskirt and draped layers in the back. A tiny white gold brooch of the Republic seal is clipped on its bodice. The hairdresser piled my hair high on my head, the loose ringlets cascading over one shoulder, and a white rose pinned behind my ear. Pearls line the choker wrapped around my throat. My eyelids are coated with glittering white eyeshadow. My lashes are bathed in snow, the puffy redness under my eyes erased by shining white powder. Everything about me is stripped of color, just as Matthias had been stripped from my life. Matthias once told me that it was not always this way, that only after the first floods and volcanic eruptions, after Republic built a barrier along the war front to keep the colony's deserters from fleeing illegally into our territory, did people start mourning for the dead by wearing white. After the first eruptions, he said, white volcanic ash rained from the sky for months. The dead and dying were covered in it. So now we wear white to remember the dead. He told me about told me this because I'd asked about asked him what, what our parents' funeral was like. Now I wander among the guests, lost and aimless, responding to the sympathetic words of those around me with appropriate, appropriate practice replies. I'm so sorry for your loss, they say. I recognize some of Matthias's professors, um, fellow soldiers and superiors. There, there are even a couple of my classmates from Drake. I'm surprised to see them. I'd never been good at making friends during my three years at college, considering my age and my hefty course load. But they're here some from after afternoon drills and others from my Republic History 421 class. They take my hand and shake their heads. First your parents and now your brother. I can't imagine how hard it is for you. No, you can't. But I smile graciously and bow my head because I know they mean well. Thank you for coming, I say. It means a lot. I know Matthias would be proud that he gave his life for his country. Sometimes I catch an admiring glance from a well-wisher around the room. 
which I ignore. I have no use for such sentiments. My outfit is not meant for them. Only for Matthias do I wear this unnecessarily ex exquisite gown to show without words how much I love him. After a while, I sit at a table near the front of the room, facing the flower-strewn altar that'll soon be occupied with a line of people reading their eulogies to my brother. I bow my head respectfully to the Republic flags. Then my eyes wander to the white coffin next to them. From here, I can see just a hint of the person lying inside. You look lovely, lovely, June. I glance up to see Thomas bow, then take a seat beside me. He's exchanged his military clothes for an elegant, white-vested suit, and his hair is freshly cut. I can tell the suit is brand new. It must have cost, cost him a fortune. Thanks. You too. That is, I mean, you look well for the circumstances, given all that's happened. I know what you mean. I reach over and pat his hand to reassure him. He gives me a smile. He looks like he wants to say something more, then decides against it and turns his eyes away. It takes a half hour for everyone to find their seats, and another half hour for the waiters to start arriving with plates of food. I don't eat anything. Commander Jameson sits opposite me on that far side of our banquet table. Between her and Thomas are three of my Drake classmates. I exchange a strained smile with them. On my left side is a man named Sean, who organizes and oversees all trials taken in Los Angeles. He administered mine. But I don't understand why, what I don't understand is why he's here. Why he even cares that Matthias died. He's a former acquaintance of our parents, so his presence is not unexpected. But why not right next to me? Then I remember that Xian had mentored, men mentored Matthias before he joined Commander Jameson's squad. Matthias hated him. The man now furrows his bushy eyebrows at me and claps his ha a hand on my bare shoulder. It lingers there for a while. How are you feeling, my dear? He asks. His words distort the scars on his face, a slice across the bridge of his nose, another jagged mark that goes from his ear to the bottom of his chin. I manage a smile. Better than expected? Well, I'll say. He lets out a laugh that makes me cringe. His eyes look up, look me up and down. That dress polishes you up like a fresh snow blossom. It takes all my control to keep the smile on my face. Stay calm, I tell myself. Xian is not a man to make you into an enemy. I loved your brother very much, you know, he continued with overdone sympathy. I remember him as a kid. You should have seen him. He used to run around your parents' living room, holding out his hands like a little gun. He was destined to enter our squads. Thank you, sir, I say. Xian saws off a huge piece of steak and shoves it in his mouth. Matthias was very attentive during the time I mentored him. Natural leader. Did he ever tell you about that? A memory flashes through my mind. The rainy night when Matthias first started working with Sean. He had taken me and Thomas, who was still in school, out to the Tanagashi sector, where I ate my first bowl of pork edame with spaghetti and sweet onion rolls. I remember the two of them were in full uniform, Matthias with his jacket open and shirt hanging loose. Thomas neatly buttoned up, with his hair carefully slicked back. Thomas teased me over my messy pigtails, but Matthias was quiet. Then, a week later, his apprenticeship with Xian ended abruptly. Matthias had filed an appeal, and he was reassigned to Commander Jameson's patrol. He said it was all classified. I lie. Xian laughs. Good boy, that Matthias was. A great apprentice. Imagine my disappointment when he was reassigned to the city patrols. He told me he just didn't have the smarts to judge the trials or organize the kids who finished taking them. Such a modest one. Always smarter than he thought he was. Just like you. He grins at me. I nod. Xian made me take the trial twice because I got a perfect score in record time. One hour, ten minutes. He thought I had cheated. Not only do I have the only perfect score in the nation, I'm probably also the only kid who has ever taken the trial twice. You're very kind, I reply. My brother was a better leader than I'll ever be. Xian shushes me with a wave of his hand. Nonsense, my dear, he says. Then he leans uncomfortably close. There's something oily and unpleasant about him. I'm personally devastated by the way he died, he says. The hands of that nasty boy. What a shame. Xian narrows his eyes, making his eyebrows look even bushier. I was so pleased when Commander Jameson told me that you'd be tracking him. His case needs a pair of fresh eyes, and you're just the doll to do it. What a gem of a test mission, eh? <laughs> Guys, I'm in the middle of reading. I can answer at the end of a chapter, okay? Hold on. 
I hate him with all my being. Th Thomas must notice my stiffness because I feel his hand over mine cover, feel my hand cover mine under the table. Just go with it, he's trying to tell me. When Xi'an finally turns away from me to answer a question from the man on his other side, Thomas leans toward me. Xi'an has a personal grudge against Day, he whispers. Is that so? I whisper back. He nods. Who do you think gave him that scar? Day did? I can't keep the surprise from my face. Xi'an is a rad rather large man and has worked for the trial administration for as long as I can remember. He's a skilled official. Could a teenage boy really wound him like that and get away with it? I glance over at Xi'an and study the scar. It's a clean cut made with a smooth edged blade. Must have happened quickly too, to be such a straight line. I can't imagine Xi'an holding still while someone sliced him like that. For a moment, just a split second, I'm on Day's side. I glance up at Commander Jameson, who stares at me if she's, as if she's reading my thoughts. It makes me uneasy. Thomas's hand touches mine again. Hey, he says, Day can't hide from the government forever. Sooner or later, we'll dig that street bread out and make an example out of him. He's no match for you, especially when you put your mind to something. Thomas's kind smile makes me weak, and suddenly I feel like Matthias is the one is the one sitting next to me and telling me everything is going to be okay, reassuring me that the Republic won't fail me. My brother had once promised to stay at my side forever. I look away from Thomas and toward the altar so he doesn't see the tears in my eyes. I can't smile back. I don't think I'll ever smile again. Let's get this over with, I whisper. So yes, to answer your question, there are different fonts for different characters. I think just to differentiate between the voices. So June's is a font that looks similar to um, like a Times New Roman. And then Day's is more of a rounded font that's gold in color. Um, why do you think they would do that? What do you guys think? Why would there be different fonts for different people? Think about it. Comment if you want to. Um, so let me see. I think I'll stop here for today because the next chapter is really long. Oh, no, it's not. Well, yeah, we're gonna stop here for today. Um, but I'll come back tomorrow or no, tomorrow's Saturday. I'll come back on Monday with another uh, set of reading. And we will continue discussing. So um, at on the comments, if you want to talk about the font, I think that's a really cool thing to talk about. Um, but also, I want you to talk about the plot, like what's been going on, what is um, happening related to uh, Matthias, and how do you think these two characters are going to end up meeting? Okay, so that's what I want you to you guys to discuss in the comments, and then we can talk about it before we read tomorrow's chapter. Um, also, if any of you would like to do a quick sum up, like literally like three or four sentences that I can read before I start reading on Monday, that would be awesome. And I will quote you. So I'll get a shout out on my wonderful video. Um, all right. So stay safe, have fun at home, and uh, we'll pick this up on Monday. All right. Bye, guys.